Just a reminder again of our book tables and uh, this IMG sign-up. We've got quite a few people signing up. For those that didn't hear me uh, this morning, if you've ever received a copy of Israel, My Glory before, we'll send it to you free to your house for a year, no strings attached. Six issues um, every year, that comes out every couple months. And uh, this issue that I'm holding up here, and by the way, all the copies that we have, I think there's some boxes that we have behind Barb and Irene back there. We, I don't want to take any of them home. So take some for your family, take some to your church. But this one here is all on anti-Semitism. And that's actually what I'm going to be talking about um, this afternoon here, anti-Semitism. Of course, everybody here knows um, that Israel is celebrating 75 years this year. Praise the Lord for that. And as a ministry, 85 years. For the Friends of Israel Gospel Ministry, 85 years as a ministry. Well, five years ago, for Israel's 70th birthday, we put together a video, uh, the Friends of Israel, and I'd like to share that uh, with you now. So, I mean, even though it was put out five years ago, it still wishes Israel a happy birthday, and uh, I think it's only fitting, being that they're celebrating 75 uh, years this year, just to show you that video. is rich in comfort, but was given over wholly to ways, a silent, mournful experience. A desolation is here that not even imagination can grace with the palm of life and action. We never saw a human being on the whole round. There was hardly a tree or a shrub anywhere. Even the olive and the cactus, those fast friends of the worthless soil, had almost deserted the country. Mark Twain, 1867, The Holy Land. More than 100 years ago, the Jewish people could not have imagined that God would restore them to their land. For many, there is little to speak that God promised a specific land to the Jewish people way back in Genesis 12, 1-3. But did you know this promise does not have an expiration date? God's plan has always involved Israel coming back to the land that he promised to Abraham. God raised up unlikely leaders like journalist Theodore Herzl, the Jewish father of modern Zionism. Gentiles like British Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour, who, in his declaration, declared Britain's support for a future Jewish nation, sparking hope in hearts throughout the world. Even as the atrocities of the Holocaust were unfolding, God was at work. On Friday afternoon, May 14, 1948, in Tel Aviv, brave men and women declared Israel a nation again. Immediately, the surrounding Arab nations attacked. Tiny Israel was dramatically outnumbered, but God was on her side. As the enemy came to destroy, God protected his people. As we look around today, it's evident the hand of God remains on this small nation. What was once a desolate country is now a thriving democracy. And through Israel, God is blessing the world. Breakthroughs in farming. Technology. Medicine. Saving lives and bettering communities around the world all because of Israeli innovation. Never in history has the world seen a nation destroyed, its people dispersed, its language disappear, and 2,000 years later brought together in their original homeland. Language now revived, and the people re-established as a nation. But on May 14, 1948, this miracle took place. A miracle in the desert. The Jewish people are home.
Happy birthday, Israel. And you know, we should rejoice with Israel because that's what we're told to do in Isaiah chapter 66, verse 10. We read, Rejoice ye with Jerusalem and be glad with her, all ye that love her. Rejoice for uh, with her, all ye that mourn for her. But of course, we know that the truth is that much of the world is really not rejoicing about Israel today. Not at all. And even more tragic, as I mentioned this morning, uh, a lot of the church isn't either. All the while, anti-Semitism is on the rise all over the world, as I'm going to now show you. In my message here this afternoon, X marks the spot. So let's just look to the Lord once again in a word of prayer. Father, we're grateful for this day. Thank you for being with each person here that have come here on this Friday, taking time out of their day to come and hear from your word. Not so much for what the speakers have to say, as, but we're here to communicate your word. And we're here to share the exciting things that you have planned for your saints, the things that you have planned for Israel. And again, we look to you, Lord, to help us understand. May your Holy Spirit just grant us that understanding and help us learn these things today and then to take what we've learned and share them with folks around us. And so we just, again, look to you and help us, Lord, during this time. And we commit it unto you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, how many here like those, um, you know, when you were a kid, you like treasure hunts. You know, I think we all like treasure hunts, uh, uh, where X marks the spot, you're looking for this particular treasure, and how many here like that kind of thing? Yeah. I mean, there's just something about the, th not very many people raise their hand, by the way. You don't like treasure hunts? <laughs> but there's just something about it, right? You know, the thrill of looking uh, with anticipation, of finding something of great value, something to cherish and rejoice in. Well, God has a special treasure, and I think you all know what it is. What is God's special treasure? Israel. Israel. I mean, we're a treasure to the Lord, too. You know, the pearl of great price. But Israel is a special treasure unto the Lord. And we read that this morning here in Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. I'm going to read it again. Jesus said again, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hidden in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for the joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Psalm 135, verse 4, also speaks of Israel as God's treasure, for the Lord hath chosen Jacob unto himself, and Israel for his peculiar treasure. Deuteronomy 14, 2, For thou art a holy people unto the Lord uh, thy God, and the Lord hath chosen thee to be a peculiar people, a treasure, if you will, unto himself, above all the nations that are upon the earth. Friends, the Jewish people are indeed a treasure unto the Lord. They are the apple of his eye, as we read in Zechariah chapter 2, verse 8. And therefore he loves them. God loves his treasure with an everlasting love, Jeremiah 31, verse 3. And then we saw this morning that he came for his own. He came for his special treasure, and they rejected the offer because they rejected him. And so what did he do? He sold all that he had, his very life, to purchase them, and he's coming back once again for them. But as we saw this morning, not until Israel repents and acknowledges their offense of rejecting Messiah Jesus. That's what we read in Matthew 23 and Hosea 5. And I said here that Satan knows that, and Satan hates that, and he hates Israel, and he hates the Jewish people with every fiber of his being, all because, well, God loves them, as we have been looking at today. And when the Jewish people repent one day near the end of the tribulation period, the long-awaited-for kingdom will come in which Satan will then be locked up in the bottomless pit for a thousand years and then ultimately cast after that period into the lake of fire for all eternity. And therefore, he is relentless in his satanic efforts to try somehow to thwart what God has said in his word. Because if there's no Israel... Well, there's no Jewish people to repent. The kingdom, obviously, will not come. And as I said, then God will be made out a liar and Satan will be judged. And that is the root cause of anti-Semitism. You know, I've had Jewish people say to me before, why does the world hate us so much? It's because Satan hates you. There is no logical explanation why an entire world would gang up on the Jewish people as in our present day, there's about 14 million. John said... Eight billion people live in the world today. 
And only 14 million Jewish people? That's less than one-tenth of one percent of the world's population. And somehow the world blames the Jewish people for the ills of so much that's happening in the world. And you are seeing here that Satan really is working overtime in the children of disobedience, as Ephesians 2.2 2 tells us. And therefore, Satan has been, will continue to, um, try to destroy the Jewish people. God's special treasure. He has an X marked on their backs. And we can see that happening in our world today. You know, I had the opportunity last May. My wife joined me. And what an opportunity this was. So the Zionist Organization of America um, has had a long-standing relationship with the Friends of Israel, particularly in the United States. And because of that, we were invited to uh, go with them on a leadership tour to Israel last May. Now, this is not a Christian organization, the Zionist Organization of America. They were made up of Jewish people, and they were taking their own. They were taking Jewish people. It was a Jewish-led tour, but they invited some Christians along, namely the Friends of Israel, because of the relationship we've had with the ZOA. And I had the privilege of taking my wife, but also three pastors. Two from Saskatchewan and the church that I attend at Faith Baptist in Regina, and one pastor um, in uh, Ontario, in uh, Waterloo. And so, praise the Lord for that. But on that leadership tour, we were, we, it was seven days, and we weren't going to the most common biblical sites that we would take people to um, on a tour if you came with us. No, this was a different tour. This leadership tour was taking us to the problematic areas. We were in Starot, right on the border with Gaza. And you can see here in this picture here, this is some of the shrapnel from the rockets that are coming out of Gaza and landing in nearby cities. This happened to be, as I mentioned, in Starot. And you can see uh, they've taken and they've made menorahs out of some of the rockets that have landed. On the top left there, you can see a picture of the schoolyard where kids go to school where one of the missiles came over and put a ginormous hole in the playground. We also got to go in that playground. Of course, the hole was filled in when we got there, but you see a bomb shelter there. You got 15 seconds. That's on paper, 15 seconds. From the time you hear the sirens until the time you get and, s and seek for coverage. Because you don't know where these missiles are going. If you remember when Hamas launched 4,500 rockets into Israel in 2021, somebody asked them, why don't you aim your rockets more strategically? You know, and you know what the, Hamas's answer to that was? We do, but their God pushes them out of the way. Here we also went to um, Hebron. Now, when I go to Israel, people say, is it safe? Oh, are you worried as a believer to go to Israel? You have an appointed day unto the Lord, and after that, the judgment, you can't add one moment to your life. You could die getting run over by a bus. You could die pushing up your Christmas lights. You could die of a heart attack, stroke, you name it. We can't add to our life. But I will say this, when you go to Israel, I feel very safe. There's checkpoints for a reason, and the Israeli security forces, the IDF, they keep the peace. They really do. I will say this, only once did I look over my shoulder to see who was beside me, and it was when we were in Hebron. Now Hebron, that is the tomb of the patriarch, patriarchs and the matriarchs. That's where Abraham and Sarah, that's where Isaac and Rebekah and Jacob and Leah are buried. Um, King Herod the Great, the builder, uh, he built all the, uh, the masonry around that. It's the same uh, uh, stones that are laid on the, on the Temple Mount on the retaining wall. And of course, the Palestinians, they say, hey, look, you know, this is ours. You, you Jews, you get lost, this is ours. And there's so much conflict there that when we went with the ZOA, we had to go on a bulletproof bus, okay? And when you're there, you see checkpoints everywhere, all around there. And you can see the bottom uh, right picture when we were there. Those Jewish shops are closed. Because what would happen, and, and they're really just right, right beside the, the Tomb of the Patriarchs, right? The, those shops are right there. And they closed them because what would happen is Palestinians would ram their cars down there and injure people. And then all kinds of violence. And so they closed it right up. And then is what we did is we walked out from there onto the main area. 
And I'll tell you, that's when I looked over my shoulder. There wasn't a child crossing the street. There wasn't a dog playing out or anybody walking a dog. There was nobody. There were no cars. I couldn't hear any birds chirping. It was a little eerie. It was a little eerie. And I'll tell you, it's not because it's Israel's fault. It's those that wish not to acknowledge Israel and having a right to exist. Namely, it's what the Palestinians are doing today. The other thing we got to do and uh, check out in the ZOA tour was we were educated on areas A, B, and C. So as a result of the Oslo Accords, Israel was divided into three segments. Now this is, I shouldn't say that, Judea and Samaria were divided into three sections, A, B, and C. Now the world likes to call it the West Bank, but it's it's Israel's biblical heartland, the area of Judea and Samaria. So area A is in full control of, uh, that. the Palestinians have full control. So think of um, Jericho, think of Bethlehem, Shechem, which they've called Nablus, think of those places. Those are in full control by the Palestinians. In fact, there's, there's signs to say, don't go in there, speaking to the Jewish people. That, that's not your area, don't go in there. So that's area A. Area B is jointly controlled with both for both the Jewish people and the, the, the Palestinians. Area C is totally controlled by Israel. Okay? Not to say that Arabs don't live there, Palestinians don't live there, but it's under Israeli control. So when we were being educated on this, you see these camps here. These are Bedouin camps in Area C. And they're allowed to set up camp there. Now what happens here is the European Union, yes, the European Union, they supply the water tanks. So Bedouins are nomadic wanderers. And so if there's water, hey, we can live. And what happens? The water tank shows up. How do you know it's a European Union? Because they've got their flag on the side of the water tank. Sometimes there's two water tanks. So the Bedouins, they set up there in Area C. The next thing you know, hey, it's got a name, the town. Now it's got a school. And now the population grows. And now if Israel was to go and move that illegal settlement, guess who looks like the bad guy? That's right, Israel. And so we were educated on that. And to take pastors along, and I remember the pastor saying to me, hey, you know, we really appreciate that the Friends of Israel, you know, is um, sending us and, and really paying our way. Why would you do such a thing? And the answer is very obvious to help you become a better advocate for Israel. Look, we don't have to agree with everything Israel does think and says, but we have to acknowledge that God has gathered his, his people back and he's given them the land. And to have, so to be that better advocate for Israel, because the world is painting a much different picture when we see it on the news. So we're seeing these attacks within Israel um, and and uh, I, remember, I think some of you might even remember some of these pictures here because this was last February. This was at a bus stop in Israel. Maybe uh, you've seen some of the news and all the attacks that's been happening in Israel. Because these two little boys, six and eight years old, they eventually died. As a Palestinian terrorist rammed his vehicle into them, leaving their father severely injured. In November, John, when we were there, and our free day in Jerusalem, we were right by that bus stop. We were right by that bus stop. And here's a picture of the terrorist. And guess what they were doing, uh, what Hamas was doing? Um, well, actually, in that car ramming, a 20-year-old uh, newlywed uh, ultra-Orthodox man was also killed. And this is what Hamas did. They wasted no time, and they took the opportunity to publish this anti-Semitic um, cartoon depict depicting, it says, a great Friday with the ultra-Orthodox Jewish man's head on a platter. How demonic is that? Also this past February, two young Israeli brothers were shot to death by a Palestinian terrorist. And of course, as usual, the Palestinians, they do this quite often. What did they do? They began to hand out candy to celebrate that despicable act. Since then, of course, Israel's seen all, a bunch of anti-Semitic attacks on the Jewish people. Here's another one. This was just a few days ago in Tel Aviv, and I'm going to play this clip here. You can see um, in Tel Aviv on the promenade right by the Mediterranean, the car comes flying over and it killed an Italian tourist and killed seven other, or injured seven other Israelis. Watch this. Just, you don't want to ban the guns in the United States. 
States, what are you going to do with the cars? Well, they want to ban those too, I guess, don't they? <laughs> and once again, after that incident, the Palestinians, they handed out candy to celebrate the death of that, that Italian tourist. I mean, it's, it's amazing. And on top of all that, as I shared last October, and I just talked about it already here um, just a few minutes ago, Hamas, 2021, 4,500 rockets coming out of Gaza. But did you know that since 2005, when Israel said, here you go, Palestinians, here's Gaza. We'll pull all our, our settlers out of there. Some 8,800 settlers Israel pulled out. And a lot of them weren't living, uh, leaving freely. The IDF had to go in on its own people and remove them by force. And Israel said, here you go. Here's the hospitals we made and constructed. Here's the greenhouses we constructed. Here's the schools we constructed. And we'll even dig up our dead and bring them with. And the thanks that Israel got, well, the Palestinians is what they wound up doing is they destroyed a lot of that infrastructure. They wound up a, a year or two later electing Hamas to rule over them. And since 2005, over 23,000 rockets have rained down in Israel. And the world, what do they do? Hey, well, let's blame Israel. And now, just within the last few days, we saw rockets once again flying from Gaza. Now it's coming from all directions. It was a test. Not only is it coming from Gaza, but they came from Syria. They came from Lebanon as well. And they were blaming Israel, just this latest round here. Blaming Israel, why? Well, because Israel is going to take over the Al-Aqsa Mosque, they said. Look, in 1967, when Israel regained control over Jerusalem, Moshe Dayan, who was the general in the Six-Day War, of course, Rabbi Gorin had the Star of David, the flag flying above the Dome of the Rock, and he was instructed to take it down. And his, his, his line was this, let's blow up the Mosque of Omar, because it's better to ask for forgiveness than it is permission. And Moshe Dayan said, take it down. And Moshe Dayan went into the Al-Aqsa Mosque, took off his shoes, and said, let's make peace. I mean, he understood that the world was against him and his people. And that's what he did. So Israel has sovereignty over the Temple Mount, but they handed custodianship over to the Jordanian waif. And so if Israel wanted to take over the Al-Aqsa Mosque, they could do that just in a heartbeat, but they don't. They maintain the status quo. But Israelis aren't even allowed to go up there and pray. You can't go up there, and it depends on the flavor of the day, by the way, when you're in Israel, whether you can even get up on top of the Temple Mount. They're in a bad mood, the Palestinians? No, you're not going up there. But what happened here, and what they were blaming Israel for, and that's why Hamas and, and others were shooting the rockets over just a, a little while ago, they said that Israel wanted to take over the Al-Aqsa. And so we had, there were some Palestinian rioters that were obviously taking orders from, guess who? Iran. Hey, lock yourself in there at the end of the day. And by the way, I hope you got lots of stones, sticks, and fireworks. Why would you have fireworks in there? I'll show you why. Have a look. This is what happens when the IDF goes in there and says, you're not staying over there. And this is used for propaganda. To make Israel look bad. Look, they're taking over the Al-Aqsa. fireworks make it look like Israel's doing some harm in there, doesn't it? And it's not. They're trying to keep the status quo. But the world doesn't see it that way. And to make matters worse, take a look at Iran's proxies. This is from Fox News. Just take a look at all around Israel. Of course, you have Hezbollah in Lebanon. You have Iraq. You have Syria. You have um, uh, in, in the Gaza Strip. You even have the cells in Judea and Samaria that Israel and their intelligence has thwarted all kinds of attacks. 
But then you have the Houthis in Yemen with their drone capabilities, and they're all proxies of Iran. And what are they waiting for? They're just waiting for the signal to let her rip. There's estimates now, well, Hezbollah's got 150,000 rockets aimed at Israel, and between all of these proxies, they're estimating it now at 250,000. Now, not all of them are smart and have that technology, but there are a lot that do. But can you imagine having 250,000 rockets pointed at you? And what does the world say about that? Not a whole bunch. Well, that was, that's in Israel. I want to just shift here to the United States now. Because anti-Semitism in the United States is up 60% and around the world, estimates say that. And you know, I've been doing the news now um, for a little over two years. And so we our virtual conferences were called What in the World is Going On? And we did that during COVID. And out of that came uh, news that I did every Wednesday called What in the World is Going On? It eventually changed to In News Surrounding Israel because that's what I did is I looked at a news article surrounding Israel and then bringing clarity to the news article and then looking at it through a biblical lens. And on our 94th episode, I had an article that was covering anti-Semitic flyers distributed in Jewish neighborhoods in Los Angeles. And what they were doing in that, those flyers is they were blaming the Jewish people for the war in Ukraine. I'll tell you what, as I brought clarity to the news, hey, you can't go and label all the Jewish people with one brush. Hey, you may identify the George Soroses or the Yuval Noah Hararis out there, but you can't go looking at them and paint all the Jewish people with the same brush, because that's what the world's been doing. They did that with the protocol, protocols of the elders of Zion. But that episode, as I brought clarity to the news and looked at the scriptures, brought more angry comments than any other episode that I did. And we're in YouTube, and we're going, delete, 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 delete. As people are saying, hey, quit covering up for those Jews. You know those Jews are responsible. You know, you're despicable. Why don't you stand up for... And it went on and on and on. Crazy. That's in the United States, also in the U.S. Now, this time it was in Atlantic, uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, more anti-Semitic flyers are thrown uh, on uh, the driveways of Jewish neighbors in, in neighborhoods. And this time it was cherry-picking New Testament scriptures. You can see a few of them there talking about the synagogue of Satan and Revelation. And they did that to demonize the Jewish people. In a recent survey of evangelicals across the United States, and I would assume Canada, well, we would probably find ourselves the same, if not worse. In that study of evangelicals in the United States, it was reported that only 51% of evangelicals believe the Jewish people are God's chosen people. Wow, what a shift that is. How can, ask yourself, how, how can that be? I mean, are they reading the same Bible that we're reading? I, I don't think so. And friends, you know what? Satan laughs at at, 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 at at people that do that. He's laughing when the church does things like that. And he laughs when Israel, the Jewish people, are persecuted and ridiculed. How, how are we doing in Canada? Well, B'nai B'rith, they are an independent Jewish human rights organization whose main goal is to expose and eradicate anti-Semitism here in Canada. This is their 2021 report. I'm still waiting for the 2022 report to come out, and it should be shortly. But how do you think we did in the 2021 report? Not good. Here's a summary. For a fourth consecutive year, this is, by the way, keep in mind, in Canada, anti-Semitic incidents exceeded the 2000 incident plateau. With a 2021, with 2021 seeing a whopping 2,799 acts of anti-Semitism. Also, Canada set a record for the sixth year in a row of anti-Semitism across the country, a 7.2% increase compared to 2020, with almost eight incidents occurring every day. And then look at this figure, and I have to double check it, it is correct, and a 733% increase of violent incidents compared to 2020. Here's some of the pictures, right here in Canada. Defaced billboards and sidewalks, destroyed Israeli flags, etc. Here's some more pictures blaming the Jewish people on COVID. Go to B'nai B'rith's website and you can search the whole article and maybe even find the 2022 report. It's alarming. 
It really is. You know, I had a Montreal man after uh, Hamas in 2021 um, sent over 4,500 rockets into Israel. Of course, if you were paying attention to the media, as I shared last October with you, the media blamed Israel. They said they were using disproportionate force. And I had a Montreal Jewish man call me, and he wanted to know if we helped uh, Jewish people make Aliyah, that is to return to Israel. And I said, yes, we do. And we had a conversation about that. And I just asked him, I said, oh, that's an exciting thing. And how long have you been in Canada? And, you know, and he just said to me, he said, Rob, he said, I'm scared. I no longer feel safe as a Jewish person living in Canada. He told me he was on his way to the synagogue. He had his keeper on. And uh, there was a bunch of angry Palestinians in a vehicle that were screaming at him and saying, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. And he's leaving. He's leaving. And the University of Regina, and I was also here at the University of Sask uh, Saskatchewan here in Saskatoon. When I first got on as a church representative with the Friends of Israel in 2018, one of the things I wanted to do was go to the university. Well, I did. In 2018, I was, since then, I've been there over a dozen times. And the very first time I'm there, I'm like, Lord, would you help me? I'm scared. I'm a little nervous here. It's a little intimidating. I'll tell you, the anti-Semitism in universities, as you get further east, it gets worse. But what do you think my time was like the very first day I was there? You think maybe the Lord would take it a little easy on me? No. So here I am at the pro-Israel table, the Friends of Israel table. Keep in mind, the University of Regina has a Palestinian flag and no Israeli flag flying with all the world flags in their hallways. But there I am with this, and here I get... Uh, well, a Palestinian student there with the Yasser Arafat neck scarf on, and he's like, hey, what, what's all this stuff here? And so I share, hey, I'm on campus uh, this week here trying to combat anti-Semitism and kind of bring some clarity to maybe some misconceptions about Israel. And, and so we have a conversation. Well, he wasn't happy that I was there. He made that evident and very clear. And so now two other Palestinians join us, so now there's three of them. And then a Pakistani Muslim gal student comes up, and now there's four of them, and they're at my table for 45 minutes, and they're not leaving. No matter what I said, and you think you have all the ammo you have to kind of teach people, forget it. They weren't interested in history. They weren't interested in the Bible. All that man with the Yasser Arafat neck scarf on was interested in is why I'm there because the IDF, he's from Jerusalem, he lived, that's where he was born, and his family is still there and he's a student here, but why does the IDF make my life and my family's life in Israel so miserable? And he's referring to the checkpoints. Not interested in history, not interested in um, why the checkpoints are there at all, just angry about Israel. And now, who? Oh, Guess what? The phones come out because he's loud and he's, he's angry and he's crying and he's angry and he's crying and they're arguing and now the phones come out and now the students get around there and oh, this is getting good. And now I can see over here that there's a Palestinian here or Arab student and there's one over here and there's one over here and these four are sitting here getting loud, attracting people and I could see these guys all communicating with one another. And what do you think I said? Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? So you're like, Lord, that, I don't think there was an answer to my prayer that day, Lord. You know? But the Jewish students came the next week when I was there and said, you're the guy. We heard that you got kicked off campus. And now the Jewish people are there taking literature. They're taking literature about the Messiah. They're taking a, I gave away three New Testaments, Hebrew, English. So, see, God always can take something and turn it around, right? But this is what the world wants us to believe. See all the orange? That's the Arab countries. You see the blue? That's little old Israel, the size of Vancouver Island, the size of New Jersey. And yet that little blue speck is stolen the land from the Arabs. That's what the world wants to believe. And we want to further divide that land. It's crazy. Well, hey, at least everything's all right in the church. No problems there with anti-Semitism, right? Not close. Well, in 2018, I think, or maybe 2019, this might, no, 2018. This is all when I first started. Boy, the Lord just uh, 
was doing wonders and just uh, has grown me so much since, th since then. But in 2018, there was an evangelical Lutheran pastor by the name of Dr. Mitri Reheb, again, at the University of Regina, on the Luther campus. Now, every year, Luther uh, College has an annual lecture where they invited, invite a, uh, an honored guest to speak to the people. And in that uh, lecture theater, by the way, it was packed primarily with older people with silver hair like mine. But Dr. Mitri, he's a very soft-spoken man, and he speaks like this, you know. Everything's just nice. You know, by the way, the Jews of the Bible, you know, they got no connection to the Jews today, you know. And that was what, that was his, that was what he was saying. He lives in Bethlehem. He's an evangelical Lutheran pastor. He sides with Palestinian Christians, he says. And he, he pastored the Christmas church there in Bethlehem, in Israel. And that was his line. And he was, he was promoting a book called Faith in the Face of Empire. Who's the face of empire? It's those Jews in Israel that have stolen Palestinian land. And so that's what he said to everybody there, that the Jews of the Bible got nothing to do with the, with, um, the, the Jewish people today, and Israel in the Bible's got nothing to do with modern-day Israel. He said, in fact, the Bible was written to Palestinians. And he said, and they view Jesus' sufferings on the cross, uh, that's what they view themselves under Israeli occupation. And you know what? Everybody in that lecture theater clapped. Well, at that time, God had myself, Larry Mitchell, a couple FOI staffers from uh, Australia. They were in my house, and we went to that lecture. We spread ourselves around, not to be rude or ignorant, but if it opened up for questions, we wanted to be prepared to ask questions, and I did. And one of my questions, I'll tell you, I was nervous. But it was a good thing. God brought that nervousness about me, because as I mentioned, he was very soft-spoken. So if you came at him too aggressively, you would have been looked at very, maybe, uh, you know, how you'd look, you'd look very aggressive. But my question was this. Dr. Mitri, you know, I was saved in 1998. And I came to know Jesus as my Lord and Savior. But I also read that God would scatter the Jewish people to the four corners of the earth. And I looked at everybody and said, hey, that's exactly what happened. That's history, right? Nobody can deny that. I said, but then I also read that God said he'd gather them back in the latter days. I said, that is also what has happened before our eyes. I said, and that there were cities that he, God would rebuild. And this man with a ponytail who was part of the organizers, he looked at me and he said, what is your question? I said, my question is very simple. Dr. Mitri, how am I supposed to understand my Bible if I'm going to read it the way you suggest? And you know what his answer was? Ah, you see, Israel has the hardware. They have the planes. They have the tanks. They have the bombs. They have the missiles. But the only reason they have the hardware is because there's a software that supplies that. And you have the wrong software, he looked at me. So basically, you Christian Zionist Jew, you dispensationalist, you fundamentalist, who read gods in a literal, historical, grammatical way, shame on you. You're the problem. I looked, he didn't say it quite like that, but he did say I had the wrong software, and I looked at him and I said, I love that software. I love that software. And here's a man that's representing Christianity. And now he's not the only professing Christian to think that way. John Stott, a theologian, said, I believe that Zionism, both political and Christian, is incompatible with biblical faith. Hank Hennegraaff, the Bible Answer Man, he said Christian Zionist beliefs and behaviors are the antithesis, they're the opposite of biblical Christianity. Tony Campbell, a pastor, author, speaker, he said the most serious threats to the well-being of the Palestinians in general and to the Christian Palestinians in particular come not from the Jews, but they come from Christian Zionists here in the United States. Well, I would extend that to myself and John and probably most of you here. We're a threat. And then there's John Piper. I don't want to step on anybody's toes. I'm not here to say John's not saved or anything, but he's dead wrong when it comes to Israel. Because this is what he says. He says that neither Jews or Palestinians can justify anything they do or be treated any particular way by claiming a present-day divine right to the land while they're living in rebellion against the one who made the land a gift of covenant keeping. And many who follow him would say, hey, you can be critical of Israel and not be anti-Semitic. You can deny Israel and not be anti-Semitic. No. You can be critical and by not agreeing with everything Israel does 
think it says. I mean, we don't agree with everything. We're not here to promote all the gay pride parades and things that Tel Aviv, you know, we're not here to condone that. But you can't be critical to say that the Jewish people have no biblical right to the land of Israel and then put them on the same level as the so-called Palestinians. Remember I told you about the revision of history with the Palestinians today and that the Jewish people were also called Palestinians back from 135 AD onward? I mean, to say that Israel has no biblical right to the land, I mean, that's anti-Semitic. Case closed. And so I want to get this straight in my mind because I was thinking about this. I was putting this together. Those that would view, like John says, they're going to take all the verses, and Dr. Mitri as well, take all the verses that speak of judgment on Israel and then believe in them literally. That God indeed scattered the Jewish people to the four corners of the earth. But yet, now they're going to shift gears right in the middle and say that all the verses telling us that God would regather his people are now not to be taken literally. And that modern Israel... It's just some sort of fluke. I think it has a lot to do with their hermeneutic and how they're reading God's word. And I think it's flawed. And I shared this last fall. You think that Israel is just a fluke? As you saw in the video, five Arab countries came against Israel in 1948. Five of them. General Sharon Aram, he was Israel's most beloved general. He was there. He fought in the War of Independence in 1948. This is what he said. He said, out of that army of five Arab countries, they put together an army of 600,000 soldiers. 600,000 soldiers. They were well-trained. They were well-armed. They were well-equipped. And they came with hundreds of tanks, hundreds of planes. And they came to finish what Hitler started, and they came across a newly formed army, Israel, with 60,000 soldiers, made up of men and women, made up of Holocaust survivors. Not everyone had a gun, General Sharon said. The reason they had a couple tanks was because a couple British soldiers married some Jewish ladies, and they smuggled a couple tanks out. Czechoslovakia was the only country that would sell them airplanes in the beginning of the war. They sold them six. They were such a lousy plane that the American pilots that trained and flew on them said they shouldn't have flown. They were a mixed mash of Hitler's army. It was like driving a Lamborghini with a tractor engine in it. Two crashed, the other four came. And when the Egyptian army coming up the Mediterranean coast saw these, these planes, that bombardments were done by throwing hand grenades out the window, but they saw the Star of David on the tail fin, they thought there must have been a squadron, and they retreated. And Israel won that war? And Israel was a fluke? 600,000 soldiers against a mere 60,000? Come on. 10 and 1 lots. Doesn't it start to sound a little bit like what you read about Gideon and the Midianites? Hey, Gideon, sorry. It's not going to be 32,000 soldiers. It's not even going to be 10,000, Gideon. It's going to be 300. Why? So that they don't, Israel doesn't take the credit, right? It's going to be 300 that's going to go face 135,000 Midianites and destroy 120 of them, 120,000. And you see, it's been that way in all the wars that Israel's fought. They've been against insurmountable odds, and yet God was with them. All because of a promise he made to Abraham in Genesis 12. Promises that we looked at last year of land, seed, and blessing. As God swore to himself in Genesis 15. And so, because of that, remember in Genesis 15, Abraham, he's, he's in a deep sleep. God himself passes through the midst and promises everything that he swore to him in Genesis 12 of land, seed, and blessing. So it's God's name that's at stake. It's on the line. And we read this this morning. Let's read it again. He says, I don't do this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but I do it for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the heathen. Where do you have went? See, God's name is profaned, wasn't it? They were to be a witness. They were to be a light to the world. And what happened? They went out and made God's name stink. This is your people? <laughs> These are the chosen people. Six million of them just died. They're your chosen people? The world laughed. But God says, I'll sanctify my great name which is profaned among the heathen, which you have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen will know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. Look at verse 24. For I'm going to take you among the heathen, I'm going to gather you out of all the countries, and I'm going to bring you into your own land. And then the very next verse says, that's when God's going to then one day pour his spirit upon them. So he's gathering them back. 
In disbelief, Psalm 132, verses 13 to 14, for the Lord hath chosen Zion. Remember that, Zion. Think of Dr. Mitri, you Christian Zionist, you. The Lord has chosen Zion. He has de desired it for his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. And so God's a Zionist. I hope you are. Does it mean what the world has relabeled really Zionism? That it's the Jews that want to control the world. It simply means that you believe and identify that the Jewish people have a right of return to the land of Israel, that the God of this universe gave to the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as an everlasting possession. As we read in Psalm 105, verses 8 to 11, He hath remembered his covenant forever. The word which he commanded to a thousand generations, which covenant which he made with Abraham and his oath unto Isaac, and confirmed the same unto Jacob for a law, and to Israel for an everlasting covenant, saying unto thee will I give the land of Canaan the lot of your inheritance. Bottom line, God gave the land to the Jewish people, period. Period. And so it's important not to get Israel's disobedience confused with their legal right to the land and mix that all up. Because Leviticus 26 makes it very clear, as God says in verse 44, and yet for all of that, he says, all of what? All of their disobedience, everything, yet for all of that, when they be in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away, neither will I abhor them to destroy them utterly and break there again my covenant, Genesis 15, with them. For I am the Lord their God. You see, you could own a nice beachfront property. You could own a nice cabin in the woods. Your name could be written on that title, but you may not be able to enjoy that possession because why? Well, maybe your health is poor or you're too busy. Now, it wasn't that Israel was too busy. It was because they were sick, but it was sin sickness that prevented them from enjoying that possession. But their name is still on the title. Make no mistake about it. Make no mistake about it. And so, Mr. Piper, you're dead wrong. And you know, it's sad that there are many in the church today that are fueling anti-Semitism with the rejection of Israel. Think to yourself, how many churches do you know that share this? How many churches give updates on things happening in Israel so we can better pray for the peace of Jerusalem? Somebody came up to me and asked me, what does it really mean to pray for the peace of Jerusalem? In Psalm 122, verse 6, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They will prosper that love me. You'll have, you'll, if Israel is well, the world is well. And we know when we really ultimately pray for the peace of Israel, we know that it's not going to be till the Prince of Peace returns. We know that. But in the meantime, in the interim period, let's pray for Israel. Let's pray that Israel's leaders are wise to the schemes of their enemies. Let's pray for believers in Israel to maybe share with Knesset members about Jesus in the Old Testament. Let's pray for that. Let's pray that terrorists would be thwarted in their, 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 their satanic efforts to harm. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They'll prosper that love thee. You know, in 2021, when I mentioned 4,500 rockets rained down. I don't know if any of you have the uh, Red Alert app, but you can go to the App Store and you can download it. And every time a rocket comes firing into Israel, your Red Alert, Red Alert app will go off. And in 2021, my phone was just a buzzing. Just buzz, 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 4,500 times. And you go to church and you're like, your heart's just melting for the Jewish people. And it's like, is anybody going to say anything? You don't need to tell me in the church. The Jewish people rejected Jesus and through their false salvation came to us. We have the Jewish people that have given us the Bible and our Messiah. We're going to come back and rule and reign with Jesus for a thousand years as he comes back to rescue the remnant of his people Israel. Israel, a modern day miracle, and the enemy wants to destroy her and in our churches. Zip. Not a word. How about just, you know, let's pray for five minutes. Not a word. I don't know about you, but I want to jump out of my skin a few times. Ah, it's political. It's political. As I mentioned, we have a difficult time 
getting into churches these days of Friends of Israel. Yeah, I don't want my pulpits to be political. Really? I say when the, the, biblical, the political is biblical, I think we ought to talk about it, right? But you know the sad thing? It's only going to get worse. It's only going to get worse. And it's going to get worse in the church. It's going to get worse in the church. I'm not saying that we are we, we go up to our elders and our pastors and scream at them. We need to pray for them. Make an appointment and talk and share from your heart. But pray. Because things aren't going to get better in the church. And it's going to continue that way until the rapture happens. And I'm going to be talking about that tomorrow morning when Jesus comes for his bride, for you and I. That's great for us, by the way. We're not going to be here for the tribulation for the time of Jacob's trouble. We're out of here. we got a wedding to go to. But for Israel, I know Brother Don's going to be sharing on this probably tomorrow as well. They're going to face even more persecution, the likes of which they've never experienced before. And it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart when Jewish people say, never again. Masada, they take the young soldiers up there again. Never again. Well, never again that they'll be scattered to the four corners of the earth, yes. But it's not true to say never again that another Holocaust is coming. Because it is. This was a recent article in the Jerusalem Post, and they found that nearly half of the Israeli public that was polled, they believe that another Holocaust is coming. And they are right. And they are right. Because that's what God's word says is coming. And look at the scriptures on the screen where the tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, it's going to be used by God to bring nation Israel as a whole to repentance and faith in Jesus, Israel's Messiah. All the while, he's going to bring his wrath on an evil, wicked world. Yes, he's going to remove the rebels from the planet during that seven-year tribulation, but he's also going to bring Israel to their knees. Think of this, you know, you and I, and I might have shared this last year, but I think it's worth repeating. How did you come to know the Lord? Maybe you came as a young person, and, and you know, young people, they'll say to me sometimes, you know, when they hear my testimony, you ask them what theirs is, and they say, oh, I don't have a very good testimony. You know, I came to know the Lord when I was five. Are you kidding? That's the best testimony. Young people, you got a testimony at five years old, you came to know the Lord, or eight years old, that's the best testimony. Living off the dividends of a well-spent youth in Christ, that's the best testimony. But that doesn't happen to everybody, does it? Some of us, God's got to, you know, let it get to the point where there's no way out. It's rock bottom. There's nowhere to turn, nowhere to go but to cry out to him. That's what's going to happen to Israel, where distress leads to salvation. Didn't bring nation Israel, didn't come to repentance when Jesus came and when he offered them the kingdom. 70 AD didn't bring nation Israel to repentance. Neither did all the pogroms, no one did the Holocaust. It's going to take to the end of the tribulation. Zechariah, writing some 2,500 years ago, in the 13th chapter, said that two thirds of the Jewish people will perish during that time. Only a third perished in the Holocaust in World War II, and yet another Holocaust is coming, and it's going to be worse. Such that Jesus said in Matthew 24, 21 to 22, For then there shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor shall ever be. And except those days be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, for Israel's sake, those days will be shortened. And once again, Satan is leading the charge in this yet future Holocaust to come. And he's coming full steam ahead for God's treasure. I didn't put these scriptures on here for a reason because I really want you to look at it in your Bible. Turn to Revelation chapter 11. We're just going to look at a few verses. Revelation chapter 11. Satan is coming full steam ahead for God's chosen people in the tribulation. And this is what we read. Remember, we talked about how Jesus is taking back the earth. He's got the title deed. He's got the seven seal scroll. He's taking back the earth. And this is what we read in uh, Revelation chapter 11, verses 15 to 17. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms, here it's coming. It's coming. It's getting closer. 
the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty-four elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thanks thee, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken thee thy great power and hast reigned. And now turn to Revelation chapter 12. Look at verses 7 to 10. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. We know that the dragon, it's Satan. Against the dragon, and the dragon fought against his angels and prevailed not, neither was there found a place any more in heaven. And the great dragon, Satan, was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and of the power of, of his Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which has accused them before our God day and night. There's coming a time, friends. Right now, presently, Satan has access, just like in the book of Job. Oh, God says, and he considered my servant Job, and, you know, he's an upright man, he's a righteous, and, and what did Satan say? Oh, well, he only does that because you have given him and blessed him, to paraphrase. Satan has access to accuse you. Oh, look at what Barb did, look at what John did, look at what Rob did, look at what Patty did. He's an accuser of the brethren all the time, day and night. And there's one day where he's coming and he's going to get the punt. Remember what we just read in Revelation? It's coming. The kingdom's coming. Jesus is going to bring his kingdom as sure as his, God's word says. And Satan, look at what happens here. Verse 11, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down, knowing that he is he ha having great wrath because he knows that he hath but a short time. And look at, for the sake of time, just verse 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her saint. The kingdom is not coming. That's Satan. I'm going to try to destroy as many Jewish people as I can. And God says two-thirds will perish. Whoa. But Satan's going to lose, isn't he? As Jesus returns for his special treasure, Israel, to rescue physically and spiritually, and to usher in the long-awaited for kingdom, which, which I said, the preeminence will shift them from the Gentiles to the Jewish people. The nations will have to come up. They'll have to come up to the Feast of Tabernacles. Can you imagine the nations grabbing the hem of the garment of a Jewish person saying, hey, take us to God for your heard that he's with you. Amazing. And no more will the Jewish people be a doormat. And so what's our response to all this? Very simple. As Brother Don shared these ten signs in which we live today, time is short. Time is short. If we're seeing tribulation signs, we're seeing Israel back in the land, we're seeing Israel's enemies want to wipe them out, we're seeing this coalition between Russia, I Iran, and Turkey, and we're, we're seeing the main players of Ezekiel 38 and 9, and, and we could just go on and on. We're seeing these things happening, and the stage being set, it tells me time is short. You don't want your family to go through the tribulation period. You do not want them to be left behind. We want to share with them about Jesus. We want to share with the Jewish people about Jesus. And so I would just say this. Be a comfort to the Jewish people. What does that mean? Paul said we should provoke them to jealousy that we may win a few. What does it mean to provoke the Jewish people to jealousy? Well, what it doesn't mean is persecuting the Jewish people. And maybe they won't listen to you after or agree with you after you've shared about Jesus. Don't persecute them like what's happened in the past where the church has called them Christ killers, Jewish person, you know, if you call yourself a missionary, it's like there's a big wall. They think of forced conversions and all of that stuff that goes along with it. Let's just love them. Let's just love them. But we're not just there just to only love them. Love them unconditionally, yes, but pray for an opportunity. You know, when the world hates them, as I've showed you, when the world hates the Jewish people, and you come alongside them and you love them unconditionally as God loves you, no matter what you do, it doesn't take long for the Jewish people to say, hey, John, why do you do what you do? Who oh, hates us? Why do you love us so much? And you have an opportunity then to share the love of Christ with them. Let's pray. It's a heavy topic, Lord. 
It's a heavy topic, but praise God that you love us. Praise God that you love the Jewish people. You're long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And that's why you haven't come yet. May we seize the time in which we have to be a light to the world around us, to be a light to the Jewish people, and to offer them comfort. May we stand up against anti-Semitism every chance we can get and gently and lovingly correct those that are promoting it. Let us reach out to our Jewish friends. Let us tell them how much we love them. And tell them why we love them. Because Jesus loves them. And he put that love in my heart for them. And so I just thank you for this time, and I just pray your blessings upon each one. And I give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.